It's April 30th, 2019. Paramount Pictures has just released the first trailer for their feature film adaptation of the iconic Sega video game franchise, Sonic the Hedgehog. This should have been a joyous and monumentous day for Sonic fans around the world, but this day has turned out to be the worst because Sonic looks like an absolute monstrosity from the realm of the Uncanny Valley. This trailer that features this fake hedgehog has made the worst first impression you could possibly make, and if you know anything about life, you probably know that making a good first impression is incredibly important. The idea of a Sonic movie was never warmly received by the fanbase due to the horrendous track record of video game movies up until this point, but nobody could have ever imagined that it would be this bad. This trailer, combined with Coolio's Gansta's Paradise and the filmmaker's butchering of Sonic's design, was a masterpiece of ineptitude so spectacular that it made Sonic 06 jealous. It seemed like Sonic was destined to continue the trend of video game movies being absolutely awful if the filmmakers were willing to butcher Sonic's character design in an effort to make him look more realistic, then there was no reason to assume that the movie would be any good. If you're a fan of Sonic the Hedgehog, you probably know how this story is going to end. The filmmakers realized how badly they screwed up, and decided to acknowledge the criticism they were receiving, and vowed to redesign Sonic. A few months later, they released a second trailer with a redesigned Sonic, and the response was overwhelmingly positive. How did a movie about a video game icon that had an initial character design that was mocked into oblivion pull a complete 180 and become something that fans actually wanted to support? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, because today, I'm going to tell the story of how the filmmakers behind Sonic the Hedgehog rescued the movie from near disaster and transformed it from a meme to one of 2020's biggest box office hits. This is the incredible redemption of Sonic the Hedgehog. In 1990, the Japanese video game company Sega was at a crossroads. They had released their 16-bit console, the Genesis, a year earlier, and while it performed decently, it wasn't anywhere close to competing with Nintendo's NES, which was practically dominating the North American video game market at the time, and a big reason as to why that was the case was a little game you've probably heard of called Super Mario Bros. The massive success of that game not only solidified Nintendo as a household name in America, it turned Mario Mario into the company's de facto mascot. Mario became just as synonymous with Nintendo as Mickey Mouse was with Disney, and that was something Sega wanted for themselves. They had previously used Alex Kidd as their mascot, but he was deemed to be unsatisfactory due to his overwhelming similarity to Mario. Sega's president at the time, Hayao Nakayama, ordered the AMA development division to create a game centered around a character that would become their next mascot. Many different ideas for a mascot character were being tossed around, including a kangaroo, a rabbit, a squirrel, and even an armadillo. The idea that was eventually chosen was a hedgehog created by designer Naoto Oshima named Mr. Needlemouse. This idea would become the basis for the character we know and love today. Mr. Needlemouse would become Sonic the Hedgehog. Sega wanted Sonic to be the complete opposite of Mario in every conceivable way, and nowhere was this more evident than his design. Sonic was colored dark blue to match the Sega logo. His shoes were inspired by Michael Jackson's boots on the album cover for Bad. Sonic's shoes were red and white because they were inspired by good old Saint Nick himself, Santa Claus. Sonic's trademark attitude was inspired by Bill Clinton's Get It Done attitude. The reason why Sonic is a hedgehog is because hedgehogs are known to be fast creatures, and the reason why the game has a fast pace is because programmer Yuji Naka was obsessed with speed and found the pace of Super Mario Bros. to be too slow. 
In addition to the things I just mentioned, the development team had some other ideas to flesh out Sonic's character, which included giving him fans, making him the lead singer of a band, and giving him a human girlfriend named Madonna. And no, it's not the one you're thinking of. These ideas were sent off to Sega's American subsidiary, Sega of America, and to say they were not on board with these radical ideas would be an understatement. SOA realized that in order for Sonic to sell in America, his image needed to be softened up. So SOA decided to make some changes to make Sonic more appealing to an American audience. They jettisoned the fans, the band, and Madonna. They also decided to redesign Sonic to give him a more American look. SOA had planned to do a full-scale redesign of Sonic, but after coming to a compromise with AMA, which by this point had renamed itself Sonic Team, they decided to do a slight redesign instead. Sonic the Hedgehog was released on June 23, 1991, and the rest, as they say, is history. From the moment it was released, Sonic was pretty much an instant hit. The game sold nearly a million copies by Christmas 1991, and between October to December of 1991, the Genesis outsold the SNES by 2 to 1, thanks in large part to the fact that Sonic was bundled with every single Genesis. Sonic was so much of a phenomenon that by January 1992, Sega overtook Nintendo as the market leader in North America, with a market share of 65%, which marked the first time since December 1985 that Nintendo was not the market leader. Sonic the Hedgehog would go on to sell over 15 million copies in its lifetime, and would spawn dozens of sequels and spin-offs, multiple animated series, comic books, merchandise, My Entire Friendship with Eric, Elise kissing Sonic back to life, Mephilus finishing the job, and the greatest thing since sliced bread, Sonic Chew. The success of Sonic attracted the attention of Hollywood studios, who were interested in bringing the speedy blue hedgehog to the big screen, and it was this interest that would kickstart one of the most improbable redemption stories in recent memory. Development on a Sonic the Hedgehog movie began in 1993, when SOA's newly appointed director of consumer products, Micheline Risley, began negotiating with Hollywood producers about the idea of bringing Sonic to the big screen. SOA's CEO at the time, Tom Kalinske, was wary about the idea of a Sonic movie because he feared it would damage the brand, and cited the recent failures of video game movies like Super Mario Bros. and Street Fighter. Despite his concern, Sega remained gun-ho about getting a Sonic movie made, and in August 1994 they teamed up with MGM and Trilogy Entertainment Group to develop a Sonic the Hedgehog feature film. MGM and Sega hired screenwriter Richard Jeffries to write a treatment for the film, and in in May 1995, he handed in his treatment titled Sonic the Hedgehog Wonders of the World. The treatment was centered around a 12-year-old boy named Josh Pinsky, who writes a paper about a test pilot named Sonic who was killed trying to break speed barriers. The catch is that the paper isn't actually finished, and he was reading it from memory. His teacher tells him to finish it by morning, or his parents will be called in. Josh's dad, Hal, builds an artificial intelligence computer that utilizes a unique system of holographic memory that he dubs XRI, Extremely Radical Intelligence. Josh breaks into the XRI to ask it to write his paper for him. When it doesn't recognize his voice, he uses a Sega Saturn with a copy of Sonic Extreme, which ends up resulting in Sonic being transported from the video game world to the real world. Sonic tells Josh that he needs to regain his energy by finding Chaos Emeralds. The pair finds one and Sonic uses it to regain his power. Josh ends up using one of the Chaos Emeralds to finish writing his paper, and when he asks Sonic for more, Sonic tells him not to use the power until he can master it. Dr. Robotnik takes over an abandoned amusement park and gives cyber body parts to a group of high school bullies that turn them into bully bots, which is all part of his plan to use the Chaos Emeralds to take over the real world. Sonic eventually gets captured by the bully bots after using all of his energy to help Josh escape. Josh lures Robotnik back to the video game world by using Sonic as bait. Sonic and Josh confronted Robotnik in the video game world and defeated him. Josh, alongside his divorced parents Hal and Lisa, step into the vortex that transports them back into the real world. While Sonic stays in the video game world, the treatment ends with Hal asking Josh to put away the XRI for safekeeping because it's far too dangerous to ever use again. Josh agrees to this, but notices that Sonic is winking at him on a nearby TV screen. After Sonic winks at Josh, he resumes his normal gameplay business. 
Even though the treatment was well received by MGM and Sega, the movie never made it past the scripting stage. Penn Densham, who was working as a producer for Trilogy Entertainment Group, believes that the movie fell apart due to creative differences between Sega and Trilogy. I believe Trilogy tried to formulate a story for the feature, but they found the origins story for Sonic and the desire to support the game's originators, it was difficult to find a common ground. We in fact withdrew and refunded MGM our development fees. Richard Jeffries believed that the reason why the movie didn't happen was because of Hollywood politics. My feeling at the time, and I could be wrong about this, but the reason movies fall apart between Hollywood and the game world is because each party feels like they should have 75% of the deal just on financial terms, but it could be at Sega that the focus groups weren't responding to the evolution of the character, and the heyday of the character was behind them. Maybe they were hoping a movie could help reinvigorate that, but maybe it was a response to where Sonic was headed, and maybe MGM came to that conclusion themselves, I don't know. That would not, one has to say, have been the worst long-term call in the world. Sega's fall from grace began in the mid-90s, and had this film been made, it would have been released in a world where Sonic was yesterday's 16-bit hero in the era of PlayStation Cool, and the cancelled Sonic Extreme wouldn't have helped either. Maybe they thought that the character was flagging and didn't want to spend $150 million on a movie with animation that will take longer. Where would Sonic be as an intellectual property by the time the film is released? That's just pure speculation on my part. After Wonders of the World crashed and burned, it took another 18 years for a Sonic movie to actually get made, but as the saying goes in Hollywood, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. In 2013, Sony Pictures Entertainment acquired the rights to make a Sonic the Hedgehog movie. And on June 10th, 2014, it was officially announced to be in the works and that it would be a live-action animation hybrid. On October 31st, 2016, Jeff Fowler, who received an Oscar nomination for writing and directing the short film Gopher Broke, was brought on board as the director, while Deadpool director Tim Miller was brought on board as an executive producer. On October 2nd, 2017, Sony Pictures decided that they no longer wanted to make a Sonic movie and put the project into turnaround. Paramount Pictures quickly snapped up the rights, and all of the key principal talent remained in place. James Marsden was cast as the human cop, Tom Wachowski. Tika Sumter was cast as his wife, Maddie. Ben Schwartz was cast as the voice of Sonic, and Jim Carrey landed the role of everyone's favorite evil scientist, Dr. Robotnik. The film began principal photography in mid-September 2018 and concluded on October 16, 2018. The film was primarily shot in Vancouver, Ladysmith, and Vancouver Island, British Columbia, while some key scenes were filmed in the United Arab Emirates. On December 10, 2018, IGN exclusively revealed the film's first teaser poster, which featured Sonic's very interesting new design. To say that Sonic's initial movie design was a radical departure from what fans had become accustomed to up until this point would be an understatement. Tim Miller explained the rationale behind the decision to give Sonic a radical new look. That was always stage one of adapting it to what the real world is and what a real animal would be like. It would be weird and it would feel like he was running around nude if he was some sort of otter-like thing. It was always for us fur and we never considered anything different. It's part of what integrates him into the real world and makes him a real creature. I don't think Sega was entirely happy with the eye decision, but these sorts of things you go, it's going to look weird if we don't do this, but everything is a discussion. And that's kind of the goal, which is to only change what's necessary and stay true to the rest of it. He's not going to feel like a Pixar character would, because I don't think that's the right aesthetic to make it feel like part of our world. Sonic's official design leaked a few months later, and it didn't look any better than the teaser poster. It was so bad that Sonic co-creator Yuji Naka stepped in to give his two cents. I feel like with this Sonic here, visually the important thing to look at is the head and body ratio and the roundness of the abdomen. I wonder if they couldn't have balanced them a little bit better. These images of Sonic aren't coming officially from the movie-making source. I think it's possible they're being strategically leaked, though getting people talking about it because it's bad can't be good for Sonic's existing IP. Well, there's also the possibility that this is fan-made, though even so, I'd still prefer it if they'd put some gloves on him. Seeing him barehanded is quite a shock. So, we've established that Sonic's movie design is not only a blight on the franchise, but a blight on humanity. 
but those were just pictures. When we actually see Sonic in motion in the form of a trailer, he's going to look great because there is no possible way that the filmmakers could screw up one of the most iconic character designs in video game history under the guise of making him look more realistic. And then this happened. Gotta go fast. SFPD! Uh, meow? <laughs> On May 2nd, 2019, the film's director, Jeff Fowler, took to Twitter to make a surprising announcement. Thank you for the support and the criticism. The message is loud and clear. You aren't happy with the design and you want changes. It's going to happen. Everyone at Paramount and Sega are fully committed to making this character the best he can be. In order to accommodate Sonic's redesign, the film's release date was pushed back from November 8th, 2019 to February 14th, 2020, which gave the teams responsible for animation and visual effects a little bit more time to complete the redesign without killing themselves due to crunch. On November 12th, 2019, Paramount released the film's second trailer, which formally revealed Sonic's redesign, and it looked absolutely fantastic. Compared to the universally panned first trailer, the second trailer received a much more positive reception, and that was mostly because Sonic actually looked like Sonic, instead of a monstrosity masquerading as Sonic. Thanks to a tweet by the rise and fall of Nickelodeon, it was originally estimated that Paramount spent $35 million to redesign Sonic, when in actuality they only spent an additional $5 million on the redesign. The redesign was completed in five months without any crunch or overtime, which is pretty remarkable because of the circumstances that made a redesign necessary. Sonic the Hedgehog released on February 14th, 2020. The film received average reviews from critics with a 63% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, but at the box office, the film would receive its well-deserved S rank. Sonic was originally projected to gross around 40 to $50 million for the four-day President's Day weekend. It ended up opening to $58 million over three days and $70 million over four days. The film would go on to gross over $319 million worldwide on a budget of $95 million, and it probably would have grossed even more if the coronavirus pandemic hadn't come along and forced theaters around the world to close. On May 28, 2020, Paramount and Sega announced that a sequel was in development and that Jeff Fowler would return to direct, while Tim Miller would return as an executive producer. Filming is set to begin in March under the working title of Emerald Hill. The cleverly titled Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is currently scheduled to be released on April 8th, 2022. And that's the story of how the filmmakers behind Sonic the Hedgehog rescued the film from near disaster to a surprising and unexpected redemption, and all it took was one man putting his ego aside to acknowledge legitimate criticism from a die-hard fanbase. The most incredible thing about this entire story is the fact that Jeff Fowler, Tim Miller, Paramount, Sega, and the rest of the film's creative team actually acknowledged the criticism regarding Sonic's original design and went out of their way to fix it. They didn't have to do that, and they didn't need to do that. They could have released the film as it was with the original design intact, and they could have gone to war with the fanbase in a manner similar to that of Ghostbusters 2016, so the fact that they didn't do either of those things should be commended. Acknowledging criticism is hard, especially when it comes to such an iconic franchise like Sonic the Hedgehog, and in my opinion, I believe the filmmakers initially dropped the ball by trying to make Sonic look more realistic, when he was never designed to look realistic. 
He's a blue hedgehog that runs really fast and has cartoonishly exaggerated proportions. It's very obvious that they gave Sonic that initial design so they could appeal to a wider audience that weren't Sonic fans. But as we all know, it didn't work and it ended up initially alienating Sonic fans and the audience they were so desperate to appeal to. It takes a lot of balls to come out and say, we screwed up, we didn't get this right, and we are going to fix what we screwed up. And that is incredibly admirable because they had no obligation to do such a thing. Making mistakes is a normal part of human nature, and if there is anything the story of the Sonic movie can teach us, it's that you can fall flat on your face in front of the entire world, but as long as you can eat some humble pie and learn from your mistakes, you can redeem yourself and claw your way back up to the mountaintop.